This video will be focusing on caring for your newly caught queen, so sit by your already caught queen, or test tubes for your future queen, and let's begin the video. To set things off, we'll start with the very moment you have caught your queen. There are three main types of queens, fully claustral, semi-claustral, and parasitic type queenettes. Most species and all of my queens are fully claustral. In short, fully claustral queens do not need any food before laying eggs. This makes them the easiest to begin with to raising a colony. And you can determine if your queen is a fully claustral queen by measuring the size of her gaster, and typically a queen with a larger gaster compared to her thorax is a clear sign that she is fully claustral. However, it doesn't hurt to give a fully claustral queen food before she has workers. I found that queens who are given honey or protein after a failed batch of eggs lay eggs again when they are ready. I once had a failed 3 queen Brescia Myrmix colony, and the surviving queen was able to get Nanitics before any other of the queens that I had caught. There are queen remains, and those are actually two queen remains to be exact, from a failed 3 queen colony attempt. But I wasn't really expecting that to happen since they were all doing well when I first put them in, but not all multiple queen colonies do as well as one would think. Back to the queen, she was probably able to get the cocoon so fast because of the additional protein. But remember, certain species are more sensitive to eating than others, so don't feed them if you know they will get stressed easily. Semi-claustral queens forage for food in the founding stages, so keep them in a tubs and tube setup once you first catch your queen. They can be identified if they have a similar sized gaster to her thorax. Sometimes it can be difficult to tell them between workers, like Pogonal Myrmix species. To tell the difference between the two, the queen is slightly larger and has wing scars, but trying to identify these characteristics can be hard to do when they're a couple feet below eye level. When you actively go ant hunting, you'll be able to determine which from which easier, so go out there and find them for yourself. Lastly, there's parasitic queens. This type is more difficult to start out with, as they need another colony to lay eggs. What makes them different from fully claustral and semi-claustral queens is that they kill the current queen of a colony and puts her pheromones, or scent, onto her own. This fools the workers of that previous colony into thinking that she was the queen all along, and after some time, the parasitic queen will have her own workers. Without an already thriving colony, the queen will not lay eggs. Now I haven't learned that much about parasitic queens since I haven't cared for my own, so if anybody has more information on parasitic queens, feel free to leave them down in the comment section. Side note, some species are also polygynous, meaning that they can have multiple queens in a colony. Some of these species include Brachymyrmix, Phaedoli, and some Solenopsis. And now polygynous colonies don't always work out, and like I said before in my previous colony, one of the queens can kill the others, or the workers can kill off the other queens. Now the next few steps are pretty straightforward. If you have a fully claustral queen, put her into a test tube setup. and leave her in the dark or undisturbed place for about a month. As known by almost all beginning ant keepers, this can be a very difficult process. Try to keep in mind that the longer your queen is not checked on, the better chances of her having workers or pupae.
but checking on her once a week is alright. Just make sure you don't move their test tube too much. I found that my carpenter ant colony, known as Campanatus sansa bianus, is more sensitive to stress than my other queens. This stress can be activated by light, heat, or just lots of movement to their setup. By the time your queen has laid eggs and developed into nanitics, or the first generation of workers, it is time to feed them. Also, it's pronounced nanitics, not nintex, ninantix, or nan what or nanictix. Guys, it's it's just nanitics. You have no idea how long I've uh, kept those images, so yeah, it's it's just nanitics. Also, fun fact. Nanitics are usually smaller than the next generation of workers, as they aren't given as much protein. Anyway, honey should be one of the very first foods you should feed to your colony. Make sure it's not too large of drops, or else the workers can drown. And this usually happens with very small species, so be careful when placing in honey or any kind of sticky substance to feed to your ants. You can do this by using a toothpick and placing it on tinfoil or paper mache. Try and experiment with other foods, and see what your colonies take a liking for. My acrobat ants, or chromatogaster vermiculata colonies, really tear up their cockroaches. Always give foods in small portions, just enough for your colonies to finish. You don't want to have excess food in your colony's nest, as it can turn into mold. Wait 2-3 to three days upon putting their food into their test tube before taking it out. You should at least feed your colonies once a week with honey, and also once a week with protein. But it all depends on the size of your colony and how fast they finish their food. Hibernation is a very important part in raising a colony. This can be done simply by placing your colony in a cold area during the winter. October to March is the best time to put them in, but whenever it gets noticeably colder outside, or if you have snow, that is a clear sign to start their hibernation. If you have a wine fridge, try putting them in there. In 55 degrees Fahrenheit, or 12 degrees Celsius, to 60 degrees Fahrenheit, or 15 degrees Celsius, is best for almost all species to hibernate in. Now if you don't have a wine fridge, and you live in a very cold area, during the winter, you can always keep them in a closet, or at the first level of your house where it's coldest, wrapped around with hand towels. Always remember you don't have to hibernate your colonies or queens, however not doing so can reduce their lifespan, or reduce the number of eggs they lay in spring. Also, if you live in a usually hot environment, or a tropical region, you probably shouldn't have to hibernate your colonies at all. If you have successfully cared for your queen until she has 5 to 20 workers, her and her workers are now ready to be moved into a formicarium or tubs and tubes setup. You can do this by connecting their test tube to their nest or placing them in and letting them move in when they are ready. Now if it's too cramped inside their test tube, it should be no problem for them to move in. But some species are known to not move in though, so to encourage them to move, you can place a light on their test tube for a couple hours to